about to pass in tablets, if you would take just a few moments, register your attendance with us, and then pass it on down to the next person. If somebody comes in after it's already been by, go ahead and give it another pass just one more time, and then the uh, board member on duty will remind you to do that one more time again during the offering. We've got a lot coming up, especially next Sunday, so I'm kind of going to focus first on next Sunday because that's where a lot of things are happening. First of all, it's back to church Sunday. Now, we've all had plenty of time to go to the lake and go to the beach and go to all of these different places, but it's time to get back in church. So I want you to take just a few moments and look around this morning, and if there's somebody that's normally in a pew that's not normally there, and you notice it, why don't you just send them a little invite this week to come back to church? That way we can have a nice full Sunday next week. Also coming up next Sunday, the youth ministry is catching on fire. Not literally. <laughs> but no, they're, they're going to start out the new school year right by being on fire for the Lord for the new school year. So they're going to have a time of friendship and fellowship after church. Is that right, baby? All right, so that's after church next Sunday. Also, card connections are next Sunday. If you've received one of those little cards in the mail just out of the blue, you know exactly just how much that means to you. So if you would, where y'all, where's Stephanie? Where y'all going to be set up, Angel? In the All right, they'll be set up in the Welcome Center. So just to take a few moments and sign a few of those cards as you're going out the door. It only takes a moment to put in a little note of kindness, but you never know just how much that means to those who receive those. All right, now coming up this week, during the week, we've got Wednesday night Bible study starting on Wednesday night at, well, the meal starts at 6. And it's going to be Jim, Todd, and Ron in the kitchen this week. Now, they just found out they were cooking, so they ain't quite got a menu yet, but I'm sure they'll have something good come Wednesday night. Then 6.30 is prayer in the pastor study, and then 7 o'clock here in the, in the sanctuary... JR is going to continue his series that he already started, What's Love Got to Do With It? He's coming from the first chapter of, I mean, the first book of Corinthians, the 13th chapter, Love is Humble. And this is part 4B. So if you missed the first three parts, you can always catch up online. All right, coming up on the 18th of September is karaoke and game night. A couple of weeks ago, we'd had... Um, Family Feud, and now that was a lot of fun. So if you want to have a good time, come out and join uh, Family Game Night. Also, on the 12th, there is a special uh, presentation by JR at Glenn's Reading Room. If you need directions or anything, see Judy. She can give you directions. And then they start a new book on the 26th, A New Kind of Christianity, Ten Questions That Are Transforming Faith. So that's coming up on the 12th and the 26th. Uh, let's see, Jay, uh, Joe give me a little Vanna White here. There's a new sign-up sheet going out for people to sign up to help clean the church. Um, as you all know, it takes a lot of hands to make for light work. And so this will be in the foyer right outside the church. If you would just take a few moments, uh, they'll work with you on what days you can come and what days you can't. Uh, you know, it's volunteer, so we just appreciate everybody who pitches in. Ain't that right, John? <laughs> All right, let's see. One more thing. Coming up on the 18th, they're looking for board members. Joe told us last week we have five open positions, and so we need to fill those. Applications may be found out in the foyer on the table. If you've thought about it and prayed about it, which I strongly encourage you to do before you get that packet, but after you've thought about it and prayed about it, fill out your packet and turn it in. There should be a due date. September 30th. September 30th is when the last packets are due. Uh, because of the, the background checks and all that we have to do in order for you to be on the board, we need those in, and so we no longer take nominations from the floor uh, because of the, legal, the legalities of the day and time that we're in. So that's why we need you to get those in before the 30th. All right. 
Let's see. Also coming up on the 12th, I forgot this one. I bet these people up in the crow's nest are loving me this morning. But on the 12th, we have membership and inquirers class. If you've ever wondered what we believe or what we think about life, love, and the pursuit of happiness in a godly fashion, then come to membership and inquirers class because that's where we tell you up front all that we believe. We, we don't believe that you ought to just join and then find out afterwards what you've got yourself into. We want you to know ahead of time. So come and be a part of that. And I've, I said it last week, I'm going to say it again this week. If it's been a long time since you've been in that, come back to it. You learn a lot and it gives you an opportunity to really reconnect with some people and connect with the new people who are coming in. It's time to wake up, isn't it? <laughs> All right, let's see. Coming up on the first and second. No, 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 that's not right. What is it? Second and third. Second and third will be hosting the Alatin Conference. Now, this is an extension of the association, but it's just... You know, J.R. and I go to that big meeting in September, no, it's in June, up in Georgia for the UCC conference. We go there, but then Alabama always hosts the Alatin conference, which was really Alabama, Tennessee, and two churches in Florida. Anyway, we're hosting this meeting on the 2nd and 3rd. The Friday night... We're having more of a church-style service. We're having a keynote speaker. The praise and worship team's going to be singing. And it's going to be a great time to come and meet some of the other churches. We've met the ones here in town, but it's also good to know who else is in our association. And so come out and be a part of that. And then on Saturday, there'll be workshop discussions on race and on the continued ministry of UCC. So come and be a part of that. Now then, let's see, did I do everything? Oh, no, I didn't do, I had a bunch here in my hand. Our newsletters are out. Ron has got them, and they'll have them right outside the front doors as you get ready to leave. So be sure and pick up your newsletter. It's gotten a little thicker this month, so he had a lot to say this month. Oh, well, bless his heart. Oh, Pastor's Appreciation, which is coming up on September the 20th. So make sure, if you don't have already have plans, make sure to be here on the 20th. For Pastor's Appreciation, we can say this what time he's not here. We will be having a, a reception following the morning service. And who's, is, who's going to speak? Richard. Richard's going to speak, okay. So Richard Barnes going to come down from Huntsville and speak. And then we'll have a big reception afterwards. It's 15 years he's been here, so let's help us celebrate a big to-do for that. And it's really not a surprise, because he really knows when his anniversary is, so we don't have to keep it under our hat. All right, answered prayers this week. We have three answered prayers this week. Susan has some answered prayers from, for a lot of volunteers that have signed up for Acolyte Ministry. Judy Hantruitt's sister, Joan Hughes, had good biopsy report, no cancer. That's huge. Yeah, that's... And talking about the Card Connections Ministry, we got a letter from a lady who used to come here, and her health is not quite what it used to be. But Leslie Toops really got a big blessing out of the cards that we sent her this last time. And so let's thank God for those. The Magic City AIDS Walk is coming up on the 27th. Covenant will have a team. If you are interested in, uh -oh, don't turn your head that way. If you're interested in being on part of the team, the website's on here where you can go and sign up. Also, there'll be more information on the foyer. Anything we're going on around here, we always put it in the foyer too, just so you know. So be sure and, and think about coming and being a part of that because that helps not only the people that we know here in this church in our community, but it helps people that you may not ever meet through Birmingham AIDS Outreach. So come and think about being a part of that. Our board member on duty today is Ms. Kate Mint. 
Our staff member on duty today is Mr. Jamie Grimes. If you have any questions or any needs, please feel free to see one of them. Our birthdays for this month, Miss Lulu Loomer, Ulmer, excuse me, is on the 7th. Loretta Hinton is on the 8th. Uh, Pam Heron's on the 9th. Megan Sisko is on the 11th. And Gwenna O'Quinn Burks is on the 12th. Let's wish them a happy birthday. I've already told you who's going to be in the kitchen, so don't forget about supper Wednesday night. And a couple of thank yous, Tammy and Jennifer, for the great Wednesday night supper that they prepared this last week. And also to Alex Mann for the great and generous donation of school supplies to help our Covenant kids. Thank you all so much. Now, y'all have heard me blabber on enough, hadn't you? All right. Let's stand up and praise Jesus this morning through song. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I knew I heard an alarm somewhere. I knew you were away. <coughs> we may be small in number, but we are mighty in spirit. Let's join together.
Would you go with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, on this day as we gather in this place, we come to bless your name. We come to lift your name on high because you are worthy. Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds this morning as we come into this place. Let us receive with gladness the words that are sung, the words that are spoken, so that they may help us in our everyday lives to uplift you each and every day. If all these things be in the holy name, we pray. Amen. At the beginning of the service, Lee, we like to remind you that no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So therefore, let us declare it so this morning in our covenant affirmation. I am a child of God. I celebrate God's Holy Spirit coming into my life. Come, Holy Spirit, come. I accept God's Spirit and power to inspire me, guide me, and motivate me to be a witness of the gospel, offering hope, showing faithfulness, and sharing joy. Thanks be to God. Alleluia and amen. Would you turn to those about you and welcome one another in service today? prayer book that's kept on the pedestal as you come in the front doors of the church 
And recorded in it are the prayers and the praise reports of the people that have come in either through the internet or by word of mouth or people have taken time to write them down in the book. But sometimes in life we have needs that are so deeply personal that we don't feel comfortable sharing those needs with others. But we still need to share them with God. And so we do that here at Covenant through unspoken requests. We lift our hand to God and we acknowledge that he is greater than we will ever be on our own. So this morning I ask, do anybody have any unspoken request? Because I know I do. As we go to prayer this morning, I want us to remember Mr. Cameron Crosby, who's been a friend of many of ours who we've known throughout the years. He, at 39 years old, he's already had some major surgery and is having more complications. And so as we gather for prayer this morning, we want to remember him and all of those who are dealing with health issues in our church this morning. Let's remember all of those as we go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you stitched us together from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. You know the workings of all of our bodies. So Lord, we know that there are those in this congregation who are suffering from pain, who are feeling heavy and downtrodden because of other health issues. And Lord, I ask this morning that you just fill them with your peace. Wrap them in your arms of grace and mercy, Lord, and let them know that you truly are the ultimate physician even when things look dire and dim. Lord, you've already proven exactly what you can do through many workers here on this church. And so, Lord, we know that you're able. And so we call upon you today in all of our lives. Not just in our health, Lord, but many of us have needs of our finances Many of us have needs of our relationships with others. Many people are still struggling to find work, Lord. And so for whatever our need of this community of believers, whatever the need may be, when your word tells us when two or three are gathered and they come to agree, you are present. Lord, there's more than two or three of us gathered and we agree. So, Lord, let your blessings flow on us today. But not just us, Lord. We ask that you bless the church universal. Let everywhere know your love today. Let just one person, just one person come to know you and your love and your mercy that you have for each one of us. Lord, we pray for the world and its leaders that they may continue to seek you out. May peace always be an option that we lean to first, even if that's not where we're going right now. Lord, be with each of us. Help us each and every day to be your hands and your feet and examples of your mercy. If all these things be in the holy name, we pray. Amen.
rise in spirit and stand as you are able for the good news which comes from the Gospel Mark chapter 7 verses 24 through 30. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.
which was a province of Syria. So this woman that they meet there is Syrophoenician by virtue of where she was born and where she lives. That's the geography of this woman. But Matthew identifies her as a Canaanite. Now, if you've ever read your Old Testament, you know that Canaan was the promised land, right? It was the land that God told the Israelites they could have at the end of their long journey. But you also know that when they got there, that land wasn't empty. They didn't just get to walk into it. They had to go to war with people who lived there and take it away from them. And so the people who lived in Canaan before the Israelites got there were the Canaanites. And the ones who weren't killed in the war fled north into what eventually became Phoenicia. So this woman is a descendant of the Canaanites that the Israelites ran out of the Promised Land. And the reason why that's important and why I think Matthew takes the trouble to kind of point that out is that this woman is more than just not a Jew. She's more than just a Gentile. She's kind of the least favorite kind of Gentile that you could possibly be at that time because she's descended from these people who historically have been at war with the children of Israel. So not a popular person with Jews like the disciples were. And so we have this strange encounter between Jesus and this woman where she comes to him for help and he says this bizarre, offensive thing. And as I started doing research for the sermon, I discovered that, of course, I'm not the first person who's ever wrestled with this passage of Scripture down through many, many hundreds of years of Christian scholarship. There have been a lot of other people who sort of tried to explain this and make it, make it better. And so one of the things that I found as I was doing my research is that both the gospel writers, when they quote what Jesus says to this woman, the Greeks had two words for dogs, you know, like a word for a big dog and a word for a little dog, and they, they used the word for little dog. And some people who write Bible commentaries really seize on this, and they say, oh, see, it's all okay. Jesus didn't call her some mutt off the street. He called her a cute little puppy. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that falls a little flat for me, because if you're going to call me a dog, I don't really care whether you're picturing like a Great Dane or a Pekingese. You still called me a dog, and I'm still offended. That's just not working for me. <laughs> Some of the other commentaries pointed out what's already obvious from the passage, that the woman isn't Jewish, and therefore she's not really Jesus' problem. Like, he doesn't have to be nice to her on a technicality. That makes Jesus sound more like a telephone customer service rep for AT&T than the Messiah. That didn't really work for me either. So finally I closed the commentaries and I put all that aside and I said, I'm just going to go back to the story. I'm going to reread it, and I'm going to pray over it, and I'm going to decide what I think this is all about. So what I'm going to share with you this morning is my interpretation of this scripture, which, by the way, you may not agree with, and that's okay. Christians have been disagreeing about scriptural interpretation for longer than I've been alive, and that's all right, as long as we don't let it cause a church fight. But I'm going to tell you what I think. So I went back, and I reread, and I reread, and I reread this passage, and I thought, okay, there's really only three possibilities here. Possibility number one, Jesus says this bizarre thing because he actually believes it. Maybe Jesus really is prejudiced against this woman, he really does think she's a dog, and this is just Jesus venting his spleen about foreigners. But it's kind of obvious from the passage that that's not true, because actions speak louder than words, right? And what Jesus actually does in this passage speaks volumes. First of all, that he even stops to engage this woman in conversation is a big deal. This is the first century. Jesus is a Jewish man, and this is a Gentile woman. For him to, for him to even acknowledge her was huge. And then for him to actually praise her faith and grant her request, clearly he's not really prejudiced against this woman. He wouldn't have done what he did. So it's okay, possibility number one is out. Jesus doesn't really believe she's a dog compared to him. The second possibility was that maybe in some way that's not immediately obvious, this exchange was for the woman's benefit. And there are some scholars who believe that, actually, that Jesus was kind of strengthening her faith by testing it. But I couldn't really quite make myself believe that either, partly because... This woman is already so far out on the limb of faith that it's practically bent down to the ground underneath her. I mean, she is chasing Jesus down the street, yelling after him. I don't think her faith needed any help. 
So it doesn't really seem to me like Jesus did this for the woman's benefit. So if it's not for Jesus' benefit, it's not for the woman's benefit, and Jesus didn't do things for no reason, it must have been for somebody else's benefit. So pop quiz, we'll see who was paying attention. Who were the somebody else's who were present when this happened? The disciples! And that is when it suddenly all made sense to me. I got it. This whole exchange, this isn't really about Jesus, isn't really about the woman, it's really about the disciples. Because it's obvious from the passage that the disciples actually have the prejudices that modern readers want to accuse Jesus of having when we read this passage. The disciples come to Jesus and say, or this woman's bothering us, get rid of her. They don't come to Jesus and say, could you hurry up and help her so that she'll shut up and leave? No. Clearly the idea that Jesus might actually help this woman has never occurred to them. They come to Jesus, get rid of her. And you might ask yourself, it's a reasonable question, why don't they just get rid of her? You would think that a large group of grown men could have chased this woman off. But that would have required them to acknowledge her. That would have required them to engage with her, which they weren't willing to do because they were Jewish men and she was a Gentile woman. They weren't even willing to speak to her. So they come to Jesus, because they've just watched Jesus feed the 5,000 and walk on water, they think Jesus will be able to get rid of her in some sort of supernatural way. Like Jesus will twitch his nose and she'll just conveniently vanish. <laughs> and nobody will have to deal with this woman. So the disciples really are racist against this woman. Now why is this a problem? Because they're not just any group of guys, they're the disciples. These are the same disciples who a little while later will be given the Great Commission, right? Jesus is going to say, now you go out and make disciples of all the nations. Here's a thought. You can't send racists to be missionaries. <laughs> That's not going to end well. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'm getting over a cold and my voice is uh, <clears throat> trying to leave me. Yeah, sending racists out to be missionaries is not going to end well for the messengers or for the message. So the disciples need an attitude adjustment in a major way, and they need it pretty quick. And that's exactly what Jesus delivers in this passage. And I recognize the technique that Jesus uses because I have been to teacher college. Yes, I have. <laughs> I paid UAB thousands of dollars to get a piece of paper with my name on it that says I am good at teaching. And to do that, I had to take a methods course. And in my science teaching methods course, I learned about something called a discrepant event demonstration. Doesn't that sound fancy? Doesn't that sound like it justifies thousands of dollars in tuition? Yeah, it's, it's not as big a deal as it sounds like. But basically, it's where a science teacher realizes that students have some misconception. They believe something that is not actually true. And then we do a demonstration that proves that false belief false in front of the students. So I'll give you an example from my teaching practice. I teach high school chemistry. And almost every kid walks into my room believing, willing to bet money, that water conducts electricity. Nearly every student, when they come in, they believe this. And if I got up and told them that that wasn't true, they would smile and nod, because that's what good students do. And then as soon as they left my classroom, they would say, wow, that woman is insane. <laughs> she doesn't think water conducts electricity. So I asked the kids, I say, does water conduct electricity? Everybody in the room nods. Yes, Ms. Green, water conducts electricity. And I say, okay, you seem pretty sure about that. So how do you know? What evidence do you have? Well, my mom won't let me take a shower when there's a lightning storm going on. She says that lightning will come through the water in the pipes and it'll zap me, okay? And my dad won't let me take the fishing boat out on the lake when there's a lightning storm. Because if lightning strikes the lake, I'm going to get fried. Okay? The lifeguard makes us get out of the pool when there's a lightning storm. So if lightning strikes the pool water, it's going to get us all. Okay. So then I pull out this little contraption that I have that's a 9-volt battery and a flashlight bulb and some wires. And I get a beaker. I've had one of the kids bring in some pond water, dump the pond water in the beaker stick the wires in there, and lo and behold, the light lights up, because the pond water conducts electricity. The kids say, yeah, yeah, see, we told you, water conducts electricity. I said, okay. I hand another kid a beaker, I said, go over to the sink and get me some tap water. The kid comes back with the tap water, stick the wires in the water. 
the light bulb lights up. And by this time, the kids were like, Miss Green, really? We got it. Water conducts electricity. We already knew this. Why are you showing us this demonstration? And I say, well, you know, the taxpayers pay me to do a job. Sometimes I have to actually do something. And uh, then, then I pull out a completely pristine, brand new beaker. And I open a bottle of distilled water. And I pour it in the beaker. And I stick the wires in the beaker. And nothing happens. The light bulb doesn't come on. And the kids go bananas. You cheated, you took the wires apart, the bulb is dead, and I have to go back and forth between the pond water, the tap water, the distilled water. I have to let the kids come up and try it themselves. Plain water, pure H2O, does not conduct electricity. And the demonstration makes them believe that in a way that just me saying it never would have. Seeing really is believing. And what makes that a discrepant event demonstration and what it makes it such an effective teaching tool is not just the demonstration itself. The craft of teaching part is what comes before that, where I make the students state their beliefs and give me their evidence and really talk about what they think and why they think it. And I make them plant their flag and say, yes, I'm sure this is what I believe. And then after that, I do the demonstration that proves what they've always believed wrong. And that's exactly what Jesus does to the disciples in this passage. Because initially, Jesus does some things that seem to support the prejudices that the disciples have, right? The first thing that Jesus does when this woman starts following them, shouting after them, is that Jesus initially ignores her. Jesus answers her not a word. It's right there in the passage. And what does that do? It doesn't drive the woman away. Right? Jesus already knows that this woman has enough faith that she's not going to be that easy to get rid of. But it gives the disciples the nerve, see, to come to Jesus and say out loud what they're really thinking. It's after Jesus ignores the woman for a while, the disciples come and say, Lord, this woman, she's bothering us. She won't stop shouting after us. Won't you get rid of her? She's driving us crazy. This is one of those points in the Gospels where it seems like the disciples are the little boys in the back of the station wagon, right? And Jesus is driving. I mean, they always have some kind of complaint back there. And today, it's like, oh, there's this girl. She's got Canaanite cooties. She's bothering us. Make her leave us alone. So they come to Jesus, and they say, get rid of this woman. And Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Notably, he doesn't say this to the woman. He says this to the disciples. And they take this as reinforcement of, yeah, we're, we're special. We're of the house of Israel, and she's not. She's nothing to us. She's not our problem. And what Jesus actually says, that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, is true. That sounds weird to us now through our lens of many years of history, because we know that Jesus was sent for all people. Jesus' death on the cross was for all people. But it is true, historically, that Jesus was sent to to the Jews. Why? Because the Jews were the people who were waiting for the Messiah. That's why God didn't send Jesus here to North America to the ancestors of the Native Americans. That's why God didn't send Jesus to Australia to the Aborigine people. God sent Jesus where he promised to send him, which was to the Jews. And Jesus preached the message to the Jews and then commissioned the disciples, the believers, to go out and preach to the rest of the nations. So Jesus is just making a, a factual statement. I was sent to the Jews. But that's not what the disciples hear. The disciples hear, because of their prejudices, oh yeah, you're right, this woman is totally not our problem, because she's not Jewish, and we are. And then the woman finally comes and falls on the ground at Jesus' feet. Please help me, Lord. And Jesus says this shocking thing about, I'm not going to take bread from the children, the Jews, and throw it to the dogs, the Gentiles. And interestingly, the woman doesn't seem particularly offended. The woman says, yes, Lord. She's like, okay, I get it. You're the Messiah to the Jews. I'm not a Jew. I know I'm not technically part of your mandate. I get it. And this is the point at which I think the disciples were probably standing around sort of elbowing each other in sadistic glee. Like, oh, did you hear that? He called her a dog. This is one foreigner who won't bother us again. I bet this Canaanite woman is sorry she ever got out of bed this morning. She won't come hound Jesus and us anymore after this. 
But the woman says, yes, Lord. And then she says, but even the dogs get the scraps from the master's table. And the disciples must be waiting at this point for Jesus to deliver, like, the verbal death blow here and just send this woman away. And instead, see, now it's time for the discrepant event. What does Jesus do? The light bulb doesn't come on. Jesus says, you have tremendous faith. Your child is healed. Go. And I wish that the gospel writers would have done what a Hollywood director would do and cut back to the disciples for a reaction shot. Because <laughs> you can just kind of imagine them all standing there with their mouths hanging open. I can't believe that just happened. Did we really just see that? Did we really just hear that? This, is this happening? But don't you think that later, when these same disciples were sent out into other lands among a bunch of foreigners to preach the message, that every time they found themselves surrounded by people who were really weird to them, if you've ever traveled in a foreign country, you know what I'm talking about. The food is weird, stuff smells strange, you don't know the language, it's just it's wearying after a while. But don't you think when they looked at somebody and they thought, wow, these people are weird, that they thought back to that moment. And they thought, yeah, that Canaanite woman was kind of weird too, but Jesus didn't send her away. Jesus praised her for her faith and healed her child and had compassion on her, and maybe that's the way that I should behave too. Because if you think about it from the woman's point of view, obviously this was a net good for the woman, right? A few days later when this woman met up with her friends in the marketplace and they said, hey, we heard you met that Jesus guy that the Jews are freaking out about. How'd that go? Do you think she said, he is so rude. You know, I met him and he called me a dog. No, of course not. She said, yes, I met Jesus, and he is exactly who the Jews say he is. He is the Son of God. He healed my daughter. He didn't even have to come lay hands on her. He just spoke the words from the other side of town, and she was instantly healed. So, obviously, the woman wasn't damaged in any way permanently by this encounter, right? So, Pastor J.R. says when we interpret Scripture, we have to do three things. We have to understand what happened. I think we've got that. We have to understand what it meant to the people it happened to in its proper historical context. I think we've got that. And finally, we have to understand what it means for us today. So I think the main idea of this passage, sort of to paraphrase a popular political slogan, is it's the faith, stupid, right? The disciples looked at this woman and they saw her body. They saw a female body, which was... <coughs> Not a great thing for having people take you seriously in the first century. They saw a body that was born in Syrian Phoenicia, foreigner. They saw a body that was descended from Canaanites, and that's all they saw. That's as far as they got. Jesus looked at that same woman, saw instantly past all that, and saw her soul. Saw a human soul, a soul created by the same God he called Abba, Father. A soul in terrible distress, and Jesus reacted out of compassion to ease that distress. And that's how it is with God and us. And we know that intellectually, because we've heard it in church, right? God loves us. We know that, but we don't always live like that's true. We forget what Paul says in Galatians about how in Christ Jesus, there is neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. And considering my audience this morning, let me just pause right there and say, if in Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female, explain to me how there can be straight or gay. Explain to me how there can be cis or trans. Those are just meaningless distinctions in God's sight, right? God doesn't care. God sees your soul. But we don't always live like that. We live like we think we're going to get to the pearly gates on the other side and St. Peter is going to come out and look us over, radio back through the gate and say, well, this one's white, Alabamian, looks like an Auburn fan to me, <laughs> smells a little gay. <laughs> Are we letting this one in? That's not what's going to happen. Come on, people. Really? Really? Because when we get to the pearly gates, what St. Peter is going to see is our soul. 
our soul. And not even, and I'm grateful, <laughs> he's not going to see my soul with all the dents and dings and scratches that it's acquired through life. See, because my soul is a believer's soul, St. Peter's going to see me wrapped in this nice, perfect blanket of grace. That's what St. Peter's going to see when I get to the other side. And so what I'm going to hear is, yeah, you can come in. Jesus has been waiting for you. Why don't you go meet Jesus? And that's what you're going to hear too. Because what God is interested in is our souls. And that is why once we get that, like once we have that in our hearts, not just in our heads, but down here, we know, we know that God is interested in our souls and Jesus has made our souls clean and that's what matters. That's what we're supposed to go out into the world and pass on. It's once you get that internalized, once you really believe it, God's all about your soul. God doesn't care where you were born. God doesn't care what color you are. God doesn't care about your previous religious background. God cares about your soul. Once you get that, you're supposed to go out in the world and share that with people. You're supposed to share that with everybody, not just the people who look like you, not just the people who eat what you eat, not just the people who speak the same language you speak, but everybody. We're supposed to go out into the world and we're supposed to share God's love the same way that Jesus shared it with this apparently unworthy Canaanite woman in this morning's passage of scripture. So I thank you for listening to my interpretation this morning. I'd be interested to know whether or not you agree. Thank you very much. Good morning. We have come to the time in our service to where we collect our offerings for the church. When you put things in this offering plate, please don't think it stays here. It's a blessing. And God is going to repay everybody that does something with a blessing for themselves. So, sure you have things to do for the church, 
and we do things for outreach and we all kind of things. But every dollar that goes in this plate turns out to be more than that. Just, just grab hold of the faith of the woman in the sermon today. If we had just a little bit of her faith, how much this could do for us. Will the ushers come forward? And if you haven't signed in, please sign in during this time. And if you're a visitor, please let us have your information. Loving God, thank you for this offering collected today so that it is used for your glory. Bless the gift and the giver and remind them when you give them their blessings. Amen. Jesus traveled with the disciples for a long time, certainly long enough to be well aware that they were not perfect. But Jesus loved them anyway, just as God knows that we're not perfect, and Jesus loves us, and God loves us anyway. All God asks is that we're honest about our shortcomings with ourselves and with God, and that we repent and ask for forgiveness. So before we come to this table of Holy Communion, Let's all take a moment to confess those things that have separated us from God, from others, and even from the best in ourselves. Let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. When God looks at you, God sees a beautiful soul he created. Therefore know this morning that God has heard your confession, and you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. On the night before he would be betrayed by the kiss of a friend, Jesus shared a meal with his imperfect disciples in an upper room. And during the course of that meal, he took bread from the Passover table. Lifting it to heaven, he gave thanks, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he passed it to them and said, Take and eat, each of you. This is my body, which will be sacrificed for you. At the end of the meal, he took the cup of Elijah, and lifting it, he blessed it and gave thanks and said, Take and drink, each of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant, which will be shed for the forgiveness of sin, for the one, and for the many. As often as you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, you do so to recall me into your memory until I come again. 
If you feel comfortable, please stretch with your hands. Just a second, let me see if I can get my mic problem.